Some programs in the series Behind Censorship, The Assault on Civil Liberties contain frank language and sexually explicit images. The inclusion of this material is there in order for the viewer to form his or her opinion regarding the issue of censorship. Viewer discretion is advised. I believe it's a battle for the soul of America. I believe it is a battle that says that what kind of country are we going to be now? Are we going to be one that listens to Latinos, Asians, African Americans, Native Americans, gays, lesbians? Or are we going to be a country that is authoritarian, homogeneous? Recipe for repression. First, stir up fears about an uncertain future. Then, heat with accusations of obscenity. Make sure to silence artists and others whose views are controversial. Serve immediately. For our next course, government issue morality. It's a long way from apple pie. <laughs> obscenity law derives from originally religious ideas about what kinds of uh, sexuality was proper. Um, and very early on, obscenity law also included blasphemy, utterances against the king, um, a whole range of what, what was then judged to be inappropriate activities. Now, we have this heritage of obscenity law, which is a, a dialogue about what's moral. If something isn't moral, it can't be shown. Through the National Endowment for the Arts, your tax dollars are being used to sponsor obscene and pornographic displays. The NEA spent $30,000 to fund an exhibit which included these revolting and indecent photos. It's extraordinary that the image that um, uh, Don Wildman thinks is offensive and allegedly obscene, he will then mail half a million copies to his churches and parishioners so they can see just how bad it is. Other perverse art funded by the NEA includes lesbian and homosexual erotic photos, artwork of Christ depicted injecting drugs into his arm, and another art exhibit with this photo of a crucifix submerged in the artist's urine entitled Piss Christ. I can't really say much about Piss Christ any more than I've already said, and uh, which is basically that uh, it reflects my own uh, ambivalent feelings about my Catholic upbringing, you know, being drawn to Christ but resisting organized religion. Uh, the work offended uh, a, a small, very small but uh, vocal minority. And, uh, you know, I think it happens to be part of a greater picture. I think the right is disturbed with what is happening in this country, and they have an agenda. The right wing believes that art that shows sexual imagery or attacks religion will break down the moral fiber of the society. But my own view is that art is the appropriate place for violence, uh, sexuality, and religious feeling, even if it's hatred. If it doesn't come out through art, it comes out through real violence and real repression and causes political misery. The Holocaust and other horrible things come if the society has no outlet. I'd like everyone to remember that this is a celebration, not a funeral. Praise God. Let's be happy about this. This is a celebration, not a funeral. Praise God. Let's be happy about this. This is a celebration. Call this nation back to moral sanity and sensibility. Change America! We must do it! Keep America strong, the America. Christianizing America. Herbert! God Almighty does not do the prayer of a Jew. I'd like everyone to remember that this is a celebration, not a funeral. Praise God. Let's be happy about this. This is a celebration, not a funeral. Let's be happy 
it seems to me that the same thing applies in censoring Serrano and Maplethorpe as in censoring two live crew. Censorship, I think, is always about the same impulse, which is to keep the homogeneous cover over everything that we think in our society. Obviously, what people like Jesse Helms and is it Donald Wildman are upset about is not the consumption of this music within the black community, but the very fact that it could spread across America to, uh, to diverse communities. We are bonded by the First Amendment. We have the freedom of expression. We have the freedom of choice. And you, Chinese, black, green, purple, Jew, you have the right to listen to whoever you want to and even the two live crew, two live crew, two live crew. So all you right-wingers, left-wingers, bigots, communists, there is a place for you in this world because this is the land of the free, the home of the brave, and two live is what we are. In the case of two live crew, what they represented, and some of the rappers who are very critical, say, of women, or of sexuality, or of gender relations, or even of homosexuality. What they're doing is articulating some of the genuine confusion that exists. There are a whole lot of people who don't even know any better. How are you ever gonna find out any better if you suppress all the questions? So my thing is, to bring these raps to the front of the classroom, figuratively speaking. Let's turn them up loud so everybody can hear them, and let's talk about what this work is saying about gender, about sexuality, about the family, about domesticity. There should be more voices out here, which is where women rappers come into it. I see this kind of power happening for women rappers as they progress in the marketplace. I also see it right away in their videos because of the heterogeneity of the images of women. The rhyme, it is wicked. Those that don't know how to be pros get evicted. A woman could bear you, break you, take you. Now it's time to rhyme. Can you relate to a sister's open up to make you holler and scream? Hey, yo, let me take it from here, queen. Excuse me, but I think I'm about to to get into precisely what I am about to do. I'm conversating to the folks who have no whatsoever clue. So listen very carefully as I break it down for you. Merrily, 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 merrily. High to happy overjoyed. Please, with all the beats and rhymes my sisters have employed. Look at me throwing down the sound totally a yes. Let me state the position. Ladies first, yes. When we find ourselves overwhelmed with these imposed definitions, one of them being the word art, we find ourselves having to defend methods of expression that are not indigenous to our own selves. At the same time, when the expression is to validate an experience from a cultural sovereign standpoint, then it's not viewed as real art. It's not worthy of the galleries or the institutions. And unfortunately, we find ourselves clamoring and fighting, making the silent agreement that this is validation. You ungrateful little, after all we've done for you, you know, we don't believe in your symbols. You must use our symbols. They're, they're not valid unless we validate them. And you really must be paranoid. I've never had an experience like that, but then, of course, I'm, I'm free, white, and 21. The obvious case is like the McCarthy era, to really come to terms with the fact that it was called a blacklist. Because what really happened to white people in the 50s is that they were put on a list that made them black. I mean, it would never be, of course, you're black and you're on a blacklist, and you're never going to be able to write for television or film until that blacklist is eliminated. But it was a kind of blacklist, and instead of being names on the list, what it was is the color of your skin. Well, well, senorita. To be in America is a complicated matter. 
You are in relation to the multiplicity of looks you are able to display. I am brown, therefore I am underdeveloped. I wear a mustache, therefore I am Mexican. I gesticulate, therefore I am Latino. I am horny, therefore I am a sexist. I speak about politics, therefore I am an American. My art is indescribable, therefore I am a performance artist. I talk, therefore I am, period. Ooh, c'est fascinant, c'est exotique. In order to multiply the perceptual readings of my identity, I always try to create interference during the broadcast. When you come from a Jesse Helms point of view, in terms of controlling the image of the family, in order to perpetuate a certain ideology of the family, in which one doesn't raise questions about its composition, does, one doesn't raise questions about sexuality, or one buries any kind of debate or critique or questioning or dissent or dissension between different factions in the community and in society so that you get it all down to a low hum, something approximating, say, a Lawrence Well tune. Our culture doesn't deal that well with sex. It's fear and loathing, fascination, arousal, intense inability to speak in a very clear way about it. We inherit an Anglo-American cultural tradition of at least 150 years old, which is an extensive dialogue about where should the line be drawn. And on the one hand, we have enormous changes, social changes, in how gender is defined, how the family is organized, enormous changes even in the sexual practices people in, engage in, as well as their attitudes. But the public discussion of that has not kept up with actual changes, and certainly sex law lags way behind those changes, and official policy lags way behind those changes. It's been a central point of the moral conservative campaign to enlist the state, its legal institutions, its you know, other kinds of mechanisms to implement controls literally over bodies. And that's what the struggle is about. Instead of going to church, I walk past the sites in Central Park where women have been raped and murdered, and thinking about the men, just the men who walked away after they performed their deed. And I think of this country's heroes and how they treated their women like the Kennedys, how they treated their women, treated Marilyn Monroe like shit, they killed her, left her for dead. Mary Jo Kopechny abandoned her like shit. Yeah, we're used to it. Instead of going to church, I walk past the sites in Central Park where women have been raped and murdered. The art world needs to see what's happened to them as part of a much larger cultural battle that's happening in the university, that's happening in popular culture, in which sexuality figures very prominently as a way to achieve your political objectives, also about gender and the family. It's important not to self-censor. It's important to make very strong arguments asserting people's right to see and develop and produce imagery with erotic or sexual content. sexuality, to ignore sexual orientation at the level of state funding, is to ignore one of the most important, one of the richest, must have, one of the most far-reaching areas of cultural work that has been done in the last 15, 20 years. Now we think, as we fuck, this nut might kill us. There might be a pin-sized hole in the condom, a lethal leak. We stop kissing tall, dark strangers, 
sucking mustaches, putting lips, tongues everywhere. We return to pictures, telephones, toys, recent lovers, private lives. Now we think as we fuck, this nut might kill, this kiss could turn to stone. The political text underlying homophobia and racism have been fanned by the AIDS crisis and the downturn of the economy. The lack of jobs, which we all know impacts most highly on minorities and poor people. The political air or the political fire is being flagged by Jesse Helms and the Southern right Christian movement. Oppression is born of fear. There is a higher visibility of gays and lesbians. There are 25 million gay people in the United States. That is no small number of taxpayers. Therefore, 25 million gay men and lesbians have every right to see our lives dramatized, photographed, painted, filmed, exhibited, read about, promoted, and protected. We have a right to be taken care of when we are ill, just like straight, white, heterosexual, middle-class males, the ruling class in this country. Indeed, the American Revolution was fought by citizens over just this issue, taxation without representation. An army of 2,500 protesters was mobilized by ACT UP. The protesters rushing into the street in well-organized waves and the cops under careful supervision, sweeping them away, dragging them to paddy wagons. As a result of AIDS, uh, we, we gays and lesbians, have <clears throat> had a great deal more visibility in the mainstream culture. And a, and a very group of images has now appeared in assorted media. I mean, it's no longer simply diesel dykes, you know, and screaming faggots. Uh, an early frost, for example, you know, you're clean cut, all American, wholly acceptable, assimilable type has been shown, you know, at prime time. So I think the main, mainstream America is much more aware than it once was that, in fact, there are a wide variety of gay and lesbian lifestyles, and we are indeed everywhere. The stronger that lesbians and gays get, the more that homoeroticism is brought out into the open as a legitimate art form or a legitimate discussion or expression of the arts, the more fearful people are going to be. Hence, the absolute parallel correlation in the rise in gay bashing. And that's all it is. That's all Helms is doing in regard to Holly Hughes. It's legislative, it's gay bashing, uh, directed at the legislature. Just imagine the most unspeakable thing being done by homosexuals, and that's what they call art. One can obviously deduce from the specific attack on Maplethorpe that it was seen as, as advantageous by those people who want to, def to, to stop state funding of culture to use homophobia. In other words, it was assumed by these people that homophobia was the winning ticket. If I had a dollar to spend for health care, I'd rather spend it on a baby or innocent person with some defect or illness, not of their own responsibility, not some person with AIDS, says the health care official on national television. And this in the middle of an hour-long video, people dying on camera because they can't even afford the limited drugs available that might extend their lives. 
and I can't even remember what this official looked like because I reached in through the TV screen and ripped his face in half. And I was diagnosed with ARC recently, and this is after the last few years of losing count of the friends and neighbors who've been dying slow, vicious, unnecessary deaths because fags and dykes and junkies are expendable in this country. The work of, of, of marginalized groups, of disenfranchised groups, is crucial to this culture because it is, it, it is the best way of showing the falseness of a universal presumption of culture. It is that which will put that notion into crisis and which will make people think about their own sexualities and about their own cultures, the, cu the, the conditions under which they even are able to think. And that's what culture is for. Never let anyone's blood, semen, or vaginal fluids inside your body. What's important as individuals is to start with ourselves and recognizing the rights of minorities to participate in everything that we do, which we cannot rely on the government to do. Our subject today is prejudice. As a matter of fact, our subject every day is prejudice. Certain characteristics have been assigned to art made by women, ethnic minorities, gay people, and white males. What happens if these characteristics appear in work made by someone other than the prevailing stereotype? Another thing that artists can do that they can contribute to the society is to work together and work on big ideas that are not easy to solve. For example, AIDS or sexual discrimination. There are several groups. There's Grand Fury, there's the Grill Girls. These are groups of artists who have a goal using the media that are available to change people's thinking. What I think we need to be fighting for and organizing around are two things. First, that funding for culture, state funding for culture in this country be brought up to a par with state funding for culture in other wealthy industrialized nations. That means we need to increase it from tenfold to a hundredfold. And two, that there be a mandate for state funding of culture that groups who are marginalized by private funding, groups such as sexual minorities, racial and ethnic minorities, those are the very groups that should be disproportionately well-funded by state funding. I think it's crucial for artists and curators to continue to apply for NEA funding for images that might have an erotic or sexual content. Um, we don't need to do the censorship job for the right-wing groups and for bureaucrats. Let them do it. Let them do it publicly. Uh, let's not do their work for them. Secondly, it's critical in our practice to resist any definition someone is offering that sexuality is equivalent to obscenity, that any erotic content is equal to obscenity. It is not. No court would see it that way. It has no legal validity whatsoever. And since it doesn't, let's not observe it in our own practice. I think it's crucial also for people in institutions um, to, to keep pushing forward. The cost of freedom is eternal vigilance and we must watch very carefully how our rights as citizens and as artists are challenged or, and whittled away by the legislature. As an artist, if they take away my right to, to express myself, eventually they'll get to you too and take away some of your rights too. 
The arts will always be a vulnerable target for budget cuts in tough times. That's just a fact of life, and it's because people, for right or wrong, think that arts are a luxury. They're not a necessity. I think that's wrong. I think the arts are a necessity for a culture over time. We will tolerate no constraint on our freedom of expression. Our art shall be judged, according to the Constitution, only on its artistic content, and that is the only permissible grounds. So we will continue to challenge any other restriction, and that is a decision that has been made by um, the art activist community. As long as you have p politics on one side and artistic, the artistic community on the other, there will always be a battle. The arts community will say this is excellent. The political side will say we don't like it or we think it's offensive. So it's a clash that will happen again and again and again. And whether it heats up will probably depend on a lot of things, whether it's an election year, whether there's mileage to be gained out of speaking out against supposed federally funded smut. We will not settle uh, for anything less than a hands, government hands-off approach to the funding of the arts. I figure you go down in flames, you just do what you can, and, and as long as possible. <laughs> there will always be people who are scared of art, but the slogan of the arts community in 89-90, fear no art, uh, should come back to tell them why they should relax. Come one, come all. When it comes to lyrics, I bring them. In spring, I sing and fall. I call out to all the ones who had a hard day. I prepare a place on my dance floor. The time is now for you to party. I thought it would be a good chance for you to move. House music always soothes, so get with the flow. Let's go. Yo, can you rock to a house group tempo? If so, then shall we let the games begin? What better opposition can you be in? I'm on fire. The flames too hot to doubt. The pool is open. Come into my house. Don't make me wait. 